Welcome to Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And we have with us here some scholars who had a conference here at Stanford on the resilient ocean. And uh, one of those is uh, Fiorenza Michelli. Professor Michelli is the chair of the oceans department at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And Theo, why don't you introduce your team and tell us about your conference? Uh, thank you, Bill. So joining us today are Margaret Cohen, who is a professor in the English department and director of the Center for the Study of the Novel, Colin Klosek, who's staff scientist at Center for Ocean Solution, and Kaiko Kooloa, who's a PhD candidate in the biology department. Oh. The conference uh, was entitled A Resilient Pacific, and uh, it was motivated by the tremendous importance of the Pacific Ocean for planetary uh, health. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is uh, uh, covers half of the all oceans on Earth and a third of our planet. And its resilience in the face of escalating threats from climate change and many other risks uh, uh, is just paramount for healthy oceans and people. The conference was organized around three themes. The first theme was knowledge, knowledge systems, discovery, exploration of the Pacific Ocean. The second theme uh, was focused on the challenges and aspirations for the region. And the third uh, part of the conference focused on solution for a resilient uh, Pacific Ocean and people. So the conference brought together a broad variety of scholars and practitioners representing a whole suite of disciplines. There were oceanographers, there were experts in performance arts, there were a representative of philanthropies and many, many others. That's incredible. So, you know, I think for most of our listeners, you would expect there to be scientists, uh, but um, uh, you really had an incredibly diverse group, uh, folks from performing arts uh, and, and other areas. Uh, uh, now, now, Margaret, uh, uh, you were involved here. I think a lot of folks might be surprised that someone who directs a center on the novel would be at a conference focusing on the resilient oceans. Uh, tell us about your participation, please. Yeah, so um, I've been studying the human practice of the oceans and its imagination for many years. And um, I was really delighted that Fio invited me to, to come join you, you, the scientists and the policy people, because as we think more and more about how, um, how we're going to devise solutions for the oceans grow going forward, it becomes clear that the ocean is practiced by people. The human ocean is really important to this enterprise. And humanity scholars have a long history and a lot of tools for thinking about humans. So that's how I came on board. Um, and uh, it was really a treat and mind expanding to see the diversity of uh, flora, fauna, and all other kinds of um, the kinds of questions that were raised uh, in this conference. Well, yeah, maybe uh, we could dive into that a little more, Margaret. What was most surprising to you about the things that you saw at the conference? Ah, what a great question and a difficult question to bring everything together. One thing that was surprising and exciting, I suppose, is that um, it wasn't all doom and gloom. I think in the humanities, we, we tend to uh, focus a lot on the tragic aspects of uh, climate change and to hear that there are all kinds of solutions that are being explored. For example, heat resistant corals is something that, that I took away, uh, was, was really exciting. I see. So uh, a lot of our listeners, they may not realize that with the changing ocean temperature, this is, this is really uh, uh, creating a problem for coral in the world. Uh, maybe, Theo, you could give a, a 30 second summary of that problem, and then uh, we can talk about uh, the heat resistant coral that, uh, that you saw uh, talked about in the conference, Margaret. Yes, Bill, the last uh, year has seen record uh, uh, ocean temperatures every day over for over a year. And we're now uh, seeing the fourth global coral bleaching event. 
the second one in the last decade alone. So coral reefs, which are a hotspot of biodiversity in the ocean, host a quarter of all species that we know from oceans, are under tremendous threat from uh, climate change. And this is happening right now in real time. So that is what the no what what the the issue is and why there's such a need for more science and more solutions to be scaled across the Pacific and uh, now globally across the ocean. And uh, now, uh, Kaiku, uh, I know you're in the coral uh, genomics lab. Uh, maybe you could give us more of an explanation around this issue of heat resistant coral. Yeah, of course. So taking a step back, the main purpose of the conference was to discuss the issues that the Pacific Ocean is facing, um, but also potential solutions. And this talk that we're talking about, thermally tolerant corals, is one of those potential solutions that were discussed. So coral reefs provide a significant source of um, biodiverse, economic, and ecologic importance to many communities across the world, including and especially uh, coastal communities. And so our lab focuses on trying to protect coral reefs and further coral conservations by seeing if we can identify thermally tolerant corals, corals that are able to survive climate change a little bit better um, than others. And by, by protecting these corals, we are hoping that we can sustain the future of coral reefs um, through our genomic research. And that was presented by Dr. Courtney Claypack at the conference under the PI or the advisorship of Dr. Steve Palumbi. Now, I'm curious about this, Kaiku, because I think for a lot of listeners, they'll be intrigued that there's not something maybe inevitably uh, destructive about the warming of the ocean. But on the other hand, what could we do about this? What you mentioned at the end of your comment that we could maybe do something about uh, uh, the bleaching of the coral uh, what what would that look like? Yeah, that is a very great question. Thank you so much, Bill. What we can use that type of information. So if we are able to identify reefs that have thermally tolerant corals, that have corals that are able to survive climate change better, we can actually target those reefs for conservation by um, creating MPAs around them um, to protect them. Or we, what we can do even further is fragment those corals and try to use them in uh, nurseries for restoration events. So restoration is basically, um, I guess you could call it coral gardening, where we're trying to grow the thermally tolerant corals in a nursery habitat and then outplanting them into uh, natural reefs to keep their populations up. I see. I see. Well, that's uh, that's that's super exciting. I know so many parts of the world uh, are going through these changes as we speak. Uh, think of the Philippines, obviously, all through uh, 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 so many different parts of the world where the world's biodiversity is being threatened. This might be key uh, to to beginning to to uh, adapt the world. It it seems like it might also be controversial. Now, Colin, um, tell us a little about your reaction to the uh, to the uh, to the conference. Uh, you're a scientist at the Stanford Center for uh, Ocean Solutions. Um, and so coming from your perspective, what did you think of what you heard at the conference? Yeah, the conference brought together, um, as uh, other folks mentioned, a lot of different groups. And that really is key to trying to identify solutions, is being able to have this diversity of experience and input um, from different areas. And so um, I think one great outcome from the conference was that we had folks um, from the California coast, but we also had folks um, from Palau and other island nations. So we were able to bring together um, different representatives from across the Pacific. Um, we were also able to bring folks from Stry and Panama on the Pacific side. So we were able to get a perspective from a lot of different uh, locations around the Pacific and talking about common themes, but also different solutions that those different locations have started to approach some of these issues with. That's super interesting. So do you see solutions actually transferring from one part of the world to another? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, lessons learned from one sector of the world can totally be applied to another sector, even if that requires a little bit of optimizing or adjusting. Um, that's the way that we're going to really be able to um, find solutions to some of these see. Problems. What's an example of that? Um, for example, the example that um, Kaiku was referring to, you know, coral restoration uh, is likely to be required throughout large parts of the globe. And so that's not just an issue in um, one location, but rather across reefs globally. And so, you know, if we can learn from um, some locations where that's being experimented with, then we can start to apply that to other locations. Or for example, the use of environmental DNA to be able to examine biodiversity within the water column. So, you know, DNA that's shed by different organisms can give us a signature of the biodiversity that's in that space. And so if we can apply that to different locations around the world, then we have a better understanding of the biodiversity taking place in those locations and how well that biodiversity is doing. Um, and also some of the arts examples that were given at the conference, um, you know, different performing arts examples, um, being able to highlight some of the challenges and also some of the opportunities that are on the horizon, um, being able to explain that and being able to interpret that through the arts is a way for people to then be able to further understand the extent of the issue and how, how it might impact their culture. Well, that's incredible. That's incredible. So, so Theo, now this is the second year you've run a conference on this, broadly speaking, this topic. What is your view on the uh, differences you're seeing in the in the in the nature of the research over the last couple of years? The um, one of the I mean, there's many many different things that could be said, but one of the really important trends um, regards the integration that is happening across uh, the sciences and more broadly across different stakeholder groups. For example, from this past conference, one of the themes that emerged very strongly in discussions is that there are trade-offs between different goals, for example, ecosystem protection and economic prosperity, you know, community development, but there are also win-wins. And those win-wins occur through the integration of these different perspectives. Uh, one of the uh, one of the most, several examples were highlighted in the conference, but one that really kind of emerged strongly for me is that these win-wins have emerged at local scales because of the many many years of coexistence of people and nature. And for example. Some of these uh, uh, successes that were highlighted uh, focus on indigenous guardianship uh, of land and ocean in island nations through the protections of forests and coral reefs, so for example, through bulls. Uh, customary uh, no-take zones that are established. So that evolution that we're seeing where local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, new technologies, for example, what Colin just highlighted, environmental DNA, you know, what Kaiko brought up in terms of uh, coral uh, thermal tolerance. So there's new knowledge is integrated with uh, traditional knowledge and tools and solutions that have been applied in these regions for century. That integration and uh, you know, across knowledge systems, across disciplines, across different actors. It's what has emerged in the first conference that focused on uh, uh, data and technology, and then in the Pacific Resilient Conference as well. I see, I see. Well, now, now, Theo, you mentioned this integration of, of uh, what we would think of as scientific knowledge uh, uh, with uh, traditional knowledge, with indigenous knowledge, Kaiku, uh, uh, please tell us a little more about yourself so the listeners understand and, and help us to understand uh, uh, maybe what uh, what Theo is getting at with that. Yeah, of course. Um, as a reminder to our audience, aloha. My name is Kaiku and I am a third year PhD student um, that is indigenous to Hawaii. I am a native Hawaiian born and raised on the small island of Molokai. Um, and my biggest takeaway from this conference is exactly what Phil was hitting on. It was how scientists and people here are all trying to support 
these indigenous coastal communities that are facing these the implications of climate change. Um, for those of you who do not who do not know, indigenous coastal communities or coastal communities in general face a lot of repercussions from climate change more than others because of sea level rise, uh, pollution of the ocean drifting into different areas, and um, the loss of their coral reefs. And what I really liked about the conference was that we all came together and we talked about how can we support these communities. We talked about um, what local communities are doing in the Marshall Islands in Palau. We had the Palau ambassador there, um, Hawaii, Samoa, Tonga, et cetera, the implications of deep sea mining and how we as scientists can support local communities. And so going back to what Phil said earlier, I think as an indigenous person, my biggest takeaway was that I feel very supported and excited to be in this field of marine science with a bunch of other collaborators who want to uplift these communities. And by uplift, I mean, who want to help make these communities the leader of their um, their own leaders of their own conservation goals. Um, and that science is just a method that we can use to support that. That That's incredible. That's incredible. You know, and I have to say, Kaiku, um, the uh, there's also an aspect of having you at the conference and as part of this call where you're clearly the uh, person who best represents the next generation in this group as well. And there is a clear generational uh, divide uh, in, in the world uh, in the sense of, you know, the, the, the 21st century. I always say I think it will your generation will be known as the greatest generation in the sense that you will be uh, conquering the challenges that that uh, the people of the 20th century, people like me, uh, brought about, and so uh, it heartens me to hear you, to hear you saying that. And uh, and uh, as a humanist, I'd like to turn to you, Margaret, to uh, uh, to to end the podcast with with any uh, observations coming off of this conference and this topic that you would like to to leave us with, please. Well, thank you for that. Uh exciting and slightly daunting uh, task. There was so much that was covered and so much that was scientific and uh, can't begin to capture that. I suppose um, one, one point to emphasize is that um, in uh, contending with climate change, it was very uh, um, evident in this, in this um, conference, we need all knowledge and all types of knowledge. We need integration, we need collaboration. And uh, just getting our, our heads around spanning the Pacific, for example, we had a presentation on the diversity of languages that were spoken in the Pacific and the question of uh, translating across them. We discussed uh, next, next uh, iteration to have uh, many more participants from indigenous communities, from communities around the Pacific. Um, I also think as, as someone in the humanities, um, and I like to think of myself as a humanist as well, that, uh, that we um, would, would be able to analyze representations further to understand how people's imagination can be ignited uh, or um, shut down by a type of representation of a shark, for example, how mindsets matter. We had a really interesting uh, uh, presentation on different types of mindsets that people bring to conservation. So there are just many, many directions that are opened up, and um, I look forward to participating uh, in the next next go around. Well, that's fantastic, and uh, thank you, Margaret Cohen, uh, Colin Klosek, Fiorenza McKelly, and Kaiku Kaholoa, and to you listeners, until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.